Hare Krishna. Hare Thank Krishna. you very much for joining once again. And uh, I was thinking today we could talk on the topic of work. This is a time when uh, many people are working from home or are not able to work or may have to look for some other work. Basically, work is a major part of our life, almost. You could say half of our waking life we spend at work. So what are the different ways in which people across history and geography have looked at work? And what are, how does spirituality infuse a fresh insight into our vision of work? Maybe that could be a topic of discussion today. Okay. So, would you like me to begin? I am fascinated by this uh, concept given in uh, one of the major Abrahamic religions, that is Christianity. And uh, the basic idea is, in paradise you don't work. All your needs are fulfilled. There is only enjoyment. And then because of man's, uh, call it rebellious nature or too much of inquisitiveness or the desire to be separate from God. This I find very much aligned with uh, the Vedic understanding. And uh, so there Adam suddenly hides from God, says that I cannot come before you because I'm naked. And then God says, who told you that? What, what, what made you aware of that? Why are you embarrassed now? He said, no, but that's reality because I am naked and I'm ashamed. So then God asked him, did you eat of that knowledge tree, which I told you not to do it? And he says that, yes. So because of this, now you won't be able to stay here. You are cast away from this beautiful place and you have to work. So, thus begins humanity's ordeal of, as they put it, work from the sweat of your brow. That means you really have to work hard. And of course, hard work is not something which goes very easily. In fact, uh, people who don't like hard work, they have this kind of humorous take that uh, the rich always say uh, hard work never killed anybody. But we hardly see them working. Of course, by this they say work means mining, cleaning the gutters, or all kinds of demeaning work. Mm. And uh, I also heard somebody from the rich class saying that hard work never killed anyone. But, but uh, why, why take a chance? <laughs> why take the chance? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So, huh? okay. so Vishnu Puran, Vishnu Puran talks in terms of Vishnu Shakti uh, Para Prokta, I think. Para Prokta, Kshetrat Nakya Tatha Para, Avidya Karma Sangya Anya Tritiya Shakti Ishyate. And uh, here we have uh, Vishnu has three potencies. There is a Para, Para, and Avidya is equated with karma, karma sangya. It's a tritiya shakti richate. And here karma means work, more specifically fruitive work. And uh, this is a terminology which when I started reading Prabhupada's books, it became so, so prevalent everywhere. Fruitive, fruitive, fruitive. It's almost as if, uh, and I never heard of it in any literature before. It was just plain work. Like if you tell somebody or a student, you work, but don't expect grades, then why should I work? If a man says, I'm working for my salary, don't expect that salary, then why should I work? So, so basically the Abrahamic uh, uh, Judeo-Christian tradition may not be Judeo, basically Christian tradition of work began with uh, Adam being cast away. And uh, after that, many people try to give it respectability. St. Augustine was the one who matter-of-factly said 
please understand work in this material world has to be miserable period there can be nothing like enjoyable work and then uh, up to the renaissance where michelangelo and da vinci and by the way they were very wealthy people they were artists they were creative so now people in the 20th century looking back at them saying that wow they loved what they were doing and they were paid for what they were doing so so we have martin luther who then started the the understanding that even the meanest of jobs baking tilling gardening cleaning you can find god through that and uh, thus was born the protestant work ethic till prabhupad when he went to america he actually praised the early americans for their hard work give everything to god at uh, least the credit and share the bounties of what you have with others so we have uh, americans having that kind of uh, identity that we are very charitable people there is lot of uh, emphasis of course things have the kaliyuga kind of uh, erosion but at least that thing is there so i am ending with this one thing with karl marx saying that work is boring work doesn't give fulfillment and today we have people either unemployed or unhappily employed <laughs> yeah <laughs> so over to you i think you said that you have certain yeah, four or so categories so yeah, let us begin with that yeah let's if i just a quick recap or just a few comments about what you said basically whenever there is a strong religious ethos there is a significant emphasis on another world beyond this world as life's ultimate purpose and uh, in some ways there is a devaluation of this world so devaluation of this world means devaluation of uh, the efforts to improve the world as not going to be consequential in any way and devaluation of the distresses of the world in the sense that uh, okay we just have to live with them bear them they are not unbearable so by devaluation do you mean discouragement yeah the, the deval it's not that big a thing okay it's, it's not the pleasures are not the improvement that you will be make is not that big that you have to work for it you won't be able to make any significant improvement and the sufferings are there they are also not that big don't make such a big issue out of it okay okay so in some ways this is equivalent to what the gita says that dukheshvanu dvignam na sukheshu vigatas kuha that don't get affected by the dualities so this is broadly the general religious world view and that does lead to de- overall devaluation of this world now we'll talk about the gita later but uh, <clears throat> this idea that to some extent there is a world denial or a world rejection that was quite central to the early early christian ethos jesus himself lived a life of poverty and uh, we could say denial to some extent and then the catholic church taught that although the church itself was Im- immensely wealthy and the popes lived in uh, lived in pomp that superseded that of even the monarchs of various countries so seeing all this there was a uh, the protestants had a, a they called the Re- reformation but it was also a rebellion against the people authority and there were there were both doctrinal and practical differences uh, but with respect to the practical differences there was in protestantism a sanctification of everyday life so if we look at european history they said there were three major 
uh, events that change the pre-modern world to the modern world. The first was the Renaissance, the second was the Reformation, and the third was uh, the Scientific Revolution, as they call it. So the Renaissance was the time, there's one author I already says that, it was as if man suddenly woke up from a stupor and started looking at the world around him as if this is also a place for curiosity and investigation and learning. So in Renaissance, it was primarily that it was a flowering of the art. So start depicting, start doing artistic things. And our Michelangelo and others were, were you could say, uh, pioneers of Renaissance. So where this world was also considered important. Now, once this world is considered important, then what happened, the next step was that those who said that this world is not that important, that were the uh, religious authorities, they were challenged and to some extent they were rejected. That was the reformation. And the third scientific revolution was in some ways that we have the power to improve this world. So, so another way of looking at it is that the Renaissance shifted the vision from the other world to this world. Then the Reformation led to a religious justification for focusing on this world. Renaissance was more of a cultural shift. Reformation was more of a religious justification for that shift. And the scientific revolution was a technological mobilization in this world. So where we start working on improving this world. In fact, by, after the scientific revolution gained momentum, it was more or less that the other world became inconsequential. Now, most people don't believe in any higher world. And even if they believe, still the idea is, this is the world we need to improve. And in fact, some early Christian thinkers, they said that just as Jesus offers redemption, at a spiritual level through Christianity. So science will offer us redemption at the material level through technology. And so correspondingly, as the emphasis on this world starts increasing, then naturally uh, the idea of what we do in the world becomes more and more important. And then if this world is just a, um, uh, what the, the Bible, I think says is a veil of tears. If this world is not a veil of tears, if this world is, a, is where we are meant to make our home and live, then what we do in this world also matters. So our view of work is also affected by our worldview. And work gains increasing importance as the worldview starts focusing more and more on this world. So that's why in today's world, you could say that now, when you, you conclude with Karl Marx, and now he was a strong rejecter of the idea of any other world. In fact, as he famously said, religion is the opium of the masses. So his idea was that to the extent uh, people are hypnotized or seduced or anesthetized by the hope of some other world, they become apathetic to their miseries in this world. So on one side, uh, he was a strong, as uh, a trenchant crit critic of religion, but he was also a strong critic of industrialization because, yes, at one level, uh, the work involved in the factories or many of the activities that resulted from industrialization, be it mines or factories or mills, it was quite dehumanizing. Because people just had to do so the same mechanical work and it was not very rewarding financially, it was not rewarding emotionally, it was not rewarding spiritually in the sense that it did not lead to any growth in any way. So that led to a big conflict between say, the world view say this world is important, but the work that I'm doing, it's utterly meaningless. Then that conflict eventually erupted as the as the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution, where 
capitalism was rejected and communism was accepted so so this is my main point that world view and work view are also quite intrinsically related uh just to add that uh, why religion was the favorite whipping boy of the marxists that the capitalists the land owners the mill owners the industrialists they would say that i am rich because i worked hard and if you work hard you also could become rich so how do you work hard you take part in my enterprise but that work as marx discovered was boring tedious and not fulfilling and when those workers would complain why i am made to work for you so then religion was thrust onto them saying that this will soothe you this will help ameliorate your woes your miseries and just like uh, opium is used as a medicine like in a war somebody has wounds and the uh, the soldier is howling in pain so the masses are howling in pain and the opium of religion is given to silence them mm. so of course after 70 years when russia rejected marxism and how people were thirsty for some religious nourishment is evidence enough that this didn't work yes the soviets tried to flatten all the churches turned them into the priests the priests who were told to become land laborers like produce something so rather than contempt like contemplation was never seen as productive it has nothing to do with human development if you manufacture a nut or a bolt then you are contributing to this world as you said that uh, and and even today we have this vestiges where people say if somebody has taken the saffron cloth so in india that uh, do you do any work or do you just uh, or the, the the are the fruits of your labor tangible countable helping the economy today or they are not so we will we will see this particular point of view later Just sort of added to that Karl Marx thing which you said. Yeah. So it's interesting. You say that uh, the idea of upward mobility through work is so central to the modern ethos. When yes, people get a job, they are not just concerned about how much that job is going to pay me right now, but also what is the trajectory up for me. Now, in the past, whether it was India or the West, more or less there was stasis in the world. Now, one's birth more or less determined one's trajectory throughout life. If somebody was born as a as a as a laborer, or as in 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 Britain there was they call it the gentry. Those are the aristocracy and the the lords and all of them and then everybody who was not the gentry they they were just they had their life of labor that's how they would live and they would die so we humans innately need the hope of a better future so if our hope for a better future dies then ultimately something within us dies when, True. so so either that hope for a better future can be at the material level or it has to be at the non material level so traditionally the hope for a better future was at a non material level and work was considered just as a means to survive here while we progress toward that non material uh, better world but if we have to create a better world here then then we have to we work and we create it and the biggest frustration comes in two ways in today's world one is that if my work does not create a better future for me so the idea is that we may say that it's a meritocracy those who work hardest they will get to the top but what if it doesn't turn out to be like that 
I work hard, but still I don't achieve I achieve the success that I wanted. I am passed over for a promotion, or somebody uses some contacts and grabs a contract that which I was wanting, and I stagnate. So within this worldview, either because of something beyond my control, I am not able to move forward. Then the work does not lead to me a better lead me to a better place. And also, if I don't like the work, then there is then there is no extrinsic fulfillment, and there is no intrinsic fulfillment also. And then work becomes unbearable. So if I don't get money, position, power, and I don't get satisfaction, meaning, joy through my work, then why am I working? So that I think is a existential. angst that gnaws at the hearts of millions in today's world any thoughts on this okay so you really put it in a nice little bracket that the kind of work i am doing is gnawing at my existence uh what is the way forward hmm. i think it is now time to for me to look at our vedic wisdom yeah so the bhagavad gita through the bhakti vedanta purports informs me that there are some things which i should kind of accept that these are the fundamental things and they cannot be done away with either by wishing them away or by meditating or by running away from it so the fight or flight response fight it and subdue it or fly away from it may not work accept it so the common acceptance is uh, understanding philosophy of work uh, which i saw and which apply to my life is uh, one has to maintain one's body if if our body is the cause of um, dissatisfaction then i need to do something about it but the basic fundamental is i need to maintain my body the second thing would be if work i must then what do i work with so i feel i work with my body but when uh, like a boss may shout at his subordinate seeing the report seeing some mathematical mistakes committed or something where were you when you were doing this or okay have you just brought your body to the office where is your mind so shila prabhupad gives us this little bit of uh extra vision that we don't work with the body but we work with the mind and intelligence so building upon these two that i have to work and i work with more uh, not with my body mainly but with my mind and intellect <clears throat> the disadvantages which i see here angst depression suffering stress could it be that i am i am not aware of the art of work that there is somebody who doesn't have tools like uh, somebody doesn't have a pneumatic drill and therefore drilling the earth i'm just giving a mundane example is difficult but if somebody gets a tool a uh, electrically operated pneumatic drill but the uh, not south poles are not properly connected and every time i touch it it gives me a shock so instead of helping me work finish my work it's actually giving me severe electric shocks so do i destroy the tool or curse it put some agarbatti on it offer it some flowers or learn the art of work which means learn the art of how to use these tools so 
the bhagavad gita encourages me to understand that work will be the cause of bondage it's a fact and the gita describes that bondage as the recurring cycle of i work i get the results i pounce upon the results covet them to myself saying this is mine i get bound up in the law of action and reaction which gives rise to more material desires which gives rise to materialistic work which gives me fruits which i am attached they never give me fulfillment and this thing continues okay so i i won't describe the solution right now i will yeah. if you want to add something to the nature of bondage because i see that uh, adam was forced to work which he need not have been subjected to that because of the desire to uh, have that rebellious idea so god allows loyal god allows loyal ideas and the reaction is you live in paradise where there is no work god also allows a separate a separatist mentality but then the result of that is you have to work augustine tells me work is miserable i also understand then there is a gradation whether if i can do higher quality work will that make me happy so people always go for like we have uh, the intellectuals administrators traders and the service sector so even arjuna kind of fell for this kind of a um, choice that uh, if contemplation is equally good then why should i engage in this warfare so work for arjuna was to kill his relatives and therefore anybody would shy away from that hmm. so so krishna is telling it's your work not mine i am not in one sense the creator of this battlefield this is your work your work happens to be that your grandfather and your teacher happened to be there and whom you love and therefore you do not want to work but if instead of that dushasan duryodhan karna shakuni came you will gladly do that work because killing them is kind of enjoyable but killing your grandfather and teacher is not enjoyable but i have news for you you have to do it it's your work so the suggested uh, formula is and and we will we will take a small Uh, gap you won't go immediately to that how does one avoid bondage now in bondage the bhagavad gita i think sums up all the things which marx did like like work makes you an automaton work makes you miserable work makes you it is not creative it doesn't give fulfillment provided mm-hmm. it gives some money but today we find people are not even happy with the money they get yes so any thoughts on that yeah it's quite a succinct summary of the context and the content of the gita's take on work i was thinking maybe i'll just first try to build a bridge between what we discussed earlier and then we'll yeah. look at the gita so i thought three things when we look at work what is the world view within which the work is viewed work is seen then what is the purpose of work in terms of its extrinsic results and in terms of its intrinsic results now if we consider the gita's context the world view of the gita is at one level undoubtedly spiritual at another level it is also world affirming when arjuna wants to renounce the world and as i said become a contemplative krishna also doesn't ask krishna also doesn't approve that at, at least in that context mm. so there are verses 
in the Gita, which could sound similar to the prosperity theology gospel that is uh, led to Americans become very wealthy. Where Krishna says, "Tasmat tamutishtha esho labhasma jitva shatrun bhungshva rajyam samruddham mayai vaite nihata purva meva nimitta matram bhava savisachi." So, in eleven thirty-three, he says that you fight, arise and fight, and win by my arrangement, and you will enjoy a prosperous kingdom. So, so there is definitely some amount of world affirmation over there in the Gita. So this world is important, but why is it important? Because Arjuna is a part of a divine plan to establish dharma in the world. So having moral and spiritual order in the world through a proper political order, through a proper administrative order, all this indicates a world affirmation. So this world is important. And if this world is important, then the work that we do is meant to maintain order in the world. This theme Krishna talks about several times. I think uh, in the third chapter he says that if you do not work, then loka sangraha, loka sangraha mevapi sampashyan kartumarhasi. Loka sangraha, it, the Sanskrit, as far as I understand, it meant it actually refers to the maintenance of the world. So there is, there are two, we could say, extrinsic results of work. One is remuneration and the other is contribution or maintenance. We contribute by playing our part to maintain the world. And we get some remuneration from the world. So Krishna also says, Sharir Yatra Pichite Na Prasiddhya Karmana. So when the Gita talks about uh, the world and the work within the world, both of them have significance. Uh, both of them are given due importance. However, the key element that you maintain, we mentioned is that the Gita talks strongly about this concept of bondage. And that is something it says we need to avoid that. So bondage can be understood at various levels. At one level, it is psychological bondage where we become attached to certain things in the world and we can't live without them. We feel ourselves pulled toward them. Asha Pasha Shatair Baddha. Arjuna and Krishna in 16.12 says that our desires become like shackles that pull us. And so when we work only for the extrinsic results, we work for money and then the things that money can buy and then we become attached to them and then we want them more and more and as we want them more and more we have to work more and more and that way we get more and more bound by it so one understanding of the bondage is psychological bondage our attachment pulls us towards the objects that we buy with work and then because to buy those objects we need money we need to work more so we work more, we buy more, and then we again work more. So we work and buy and work and buy. And we hope that by buying we will enjoy. But do we really enjoy by that? That is a that is an open question. I I once I summarized the modern way of living. Now we work, 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 and work is frustrating. So then I want a break, so I come back and watch uh, television, or watch movies, watch things on my phone now, and then I watch, 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 just wanted to escape from the boredom and the frustration of the world. But when I watch, I see so many wealthy and pretty people, I want to become like them. So then I go and shop things. So the essence of modern life can be summarized in these three activities. Work, watch, shop. When you watch, shop, then you again you want to you shop so much, hey, I don't have so much money, then I have to work more. I work more, I get frustrated more, then I watch more. And I try to escape from the world. But then when in trying to escape through the world, escape from the world through television and entertainment, 
Now, there is a big difference. Even if, say, religion was supposed to uh, help people uh, make life bearable for them by giving them some hope for some other world. Now, television also does the same thing. Life is boring, life is frustrating, and you escape from it. But the key difference is that religion, while helping, uh, while giving us a uh, escape away from the world, it decreases our infatuation with the world. Whereas television, it gives us an escape away from the world. But what is shown on the television, you probably see very attractive looking people living in magnificent houses. And to become like that, that craving, that lust, that greed, that actually increases the infatuation with the world. So then we watch, but by watching, there is only temporary escape and come back and we shock. So WWS, I call this as worldwide stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, so, so we can't actually see that people are bound by working. Then just they're bound to, bound to working more, shopping more, escaping more through watching. So even if we don't consider the philosophical aspect of the repetition of the cycle of birth and death, we can see that people are bound. The people are bound by their mortgages that they have taken. People are bound by the credit card debts that they owe. And people are bound by the desires that they have, they have got, which just don't allow them to live peacefully. So this could be a contemporary explanation of bondage and that will inspire us. Maybe is there, is there a way I can become free from bondage? Is there a way I can work without becoming bound? So, so here, uh, let us say somebody knows that he's bound. Somebody wants to kick the spiral of working hard, and then going to some resort or some nightclub or some food court or some movie plex. And then again coming and feeling remorse or not knowing exactly where this is leading to. Krishna jolts a person's mind by saying that uh, Arjun, those who want to enjoy the fruits of their labor are misers. The first time I read it, I said, uh, is it not true that if I work for something, then the fruit belongs to me? Where is the question of misers here? Kripana fala he tavaha. So, miserliness is keeping the fruits with you and broad-mindedness is what is broad-mindedness? Giving it up or uh, like getting gold and burying it or uh, throwing it away. What exactly I'm supposed to do with the fruits of my work? So this is not in the Bhagavad Gita directly but Krishna does talk of Amritam Ashnute, tasting immortality or tasting nectar. So what Martin Luther told his people that you could be doing the simplest of things. You could be a janitor, you could be a, uh, an usher in some drama or Broadway, or you could be a street sweeper. But there is God in God is to God is to be found in the work you do. So so that aspect, Krishna keeps it alive by saying that offer the fruits of your work directly to me. Now there is some leap of faith which is involved here that as such I am not happy with the fruits I am making, and then I should take a complete 180 degree turn and give the fruits to you. Why? So that is explained in other uh, bhakti tradition wisdom texts where it is said that 
रसो वही सहा कृष्ण इज द पर्सोनिफिकेशन ऑफ ऑल रसा ऑल हैप्पीनेस ऑल ब्लिस एंड गिविंग योर फ्रूट्स टू हिम यू नेवर आर अ लूजर सो राधर देन टू गिव ए कंटेम्पररी एग्जाम्पल If there is a company which is making twenty five percent net profits every year, so not investing in that corporation stock and keeping it in your own home where there is no increase. If you keep money at your own place, there is an increase. So not utilizing something means miserliness because if you utilize properly, it may increase. So. Krishna, as a supreme person who got it introduced in the Bhagavad Gita, is not just the the enjoyer of all work, the enjoyer of all sacrifices, Yagnyo Vai Vishnu, but he is the one who can expertly give you that creativity, that fulfillment. For example, this is a this is a example given worldwide. I have seen so many motivational speakers and so many people. they tell it but only when you read the bhagavad gita you can understand the essence of it like there are three people who are breaking stones and it's a european example so they are building a cathedral so the first one is asked my dear good man what are you doing can't you see i'm breaking stones so he is a worker in the mode of ignorance he doesn't like what he is doing he is a grumbler dirga sutri he tries to do as less as possible mm. the second one says well i am breaking stones i was working in a quarry over there but here i am getting 10 cents more per hour so here is somebody who knows what he is doing but he is attracted merely because the wages are higher the third one says i have been told that they are making a cathedral i am happy to be a part of it we are making a house of god so the outward act is the same the hammer chisel and the stones are exactly identical but as we discussed at the beginning that proper said you work not with the body but with the mind and intellect so with the mind and intellect you can uplift yourself and it could be any kind of menial any kind of so called third grade work but the reciprocation coming from krishna will give you creativity will give you fulfillment will give you happiness and even like proper said even after the gita's discourse was over arjuna remained a warrior it's not like he became a contemplative sage or he went to the forest so the gita's ideal of work is there is a sea change for sure but not in the tools not in the bearer of the tools but in the consciousness of the bearer of the tools beautiful so to again try to rephrase yeah. what you said in maybe the context of what we discussed earlier if we talk about the extrinsic rewards of work and the intrinsic rewards of work so we can say that when krishna is telling be detached don't be detached from the fruits of your work so he, he is talking about that don't be attached to the extrinsic fruits so yeah. work is talked about in the bhagavad gita at uh, various levels at the most uh, if you know everything that we do can be placed in increasingly bigger contexts so right now i can say that i am speaking to you that's an activity another thing i can say is that you now we are discussing the wisdom of the bhagavad gita another thing we can say is that you now we are getting a better understanding of how we can live in the world or how we can share with others how we can live in the world so like like you talked about the work itself that whether i am just breaking stones or i am building a cathedral so similarly Uh, we could say remuneration is a relatively speaking small result of the work 
आणि दॅट्स वॉट आय गेट इन्फॅच्युएटेड विथ देन आय ब्लाइंड माय सेल्फ टू सम बिगर रिझल्ट अँड वॉट इज दॅट बिगर रिझल्ट सो आय फील इट इज अ थ्री लेवल्स वन इज अपार्ट फ्रॉम रिम्युनरेशन देर इज अ बिगर इज कॉन्ट्रीब्युशन you contribute to society you do your dharma you help krishna in establishing dharma in the world so there is a social contribution and for arjuna he feels that when if i fight the war the remuneration i get i will win the kingdom it is not worth it because i am going to lose my 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 teacher and my grandfather and not only i'm going to lose them i may have to kill them and he feel this is not worth it that bunjiya bhogan rudhir pradigdan it will all be tainted with blood of my loved ones so at that level of calculation if i consider gaining a gaining the remuneration of gaining a kingdom or losing my loved ones but at that level the war doesn't seem to be worth it so he so he says no but krishna has a bigger vision that you are fighting to contribute to society contribute to society for establishing order in society and beyond that krishna talks also about at another level of work is you could say psychophysical harmonization krishna tells arjuna later that स्वभाव जेन कौंते निबद्ध स्वेन कर्ण कर्तुम नेच्छसि यन मोहात करिष्यस्य अवशोपित दैट यू आर बाउंड बाय योर स्वभाव टू डू अ पर्टिकुलर काइंड ऑफ वर्क इफ यू डोंट डू इट नाउ यू विल डू इट लेटर यू विल से राइट नाउ आई वांट टू लिव लाइक अ ब्राह्मण आई वांट टू लिव लाइक अ कंटेम्पलेटिव बट देन व्हेन द प्रोवोकेशन कम्स इमीडिएटली यू विल रेज योर वेपन्स सो सो देयर इज अ सर्टेन वर्क व्हिच इज नेचुरल फॉर यू and when the work is natural we do it because that work itself is what gives us satisfaction so at that particular point arjuna has got so caught in the external cost of the work that he is he is blinded to the fact that this is what he is meant to do i read about writing at one place a uh, one question one person aspiring writer asked a promising ask an established writer uh, i don't feel like writing what should i do i said if you don't feel like writing there is nothing i can tell you to do that will make you feel like writing <laughs> if you don't feel like writing just stop writing and then he said after some time if you feel if i don't write what am i going to do if you feel that i can't live without writing then you will come back to writing with greater conviction so i think uh, it was isaac As- asimov who said that if i knew i, I was going that. to di- if i was, <laughs> if i know i'm going to die uh, within say what something like 1 minute or 10 minutes or 1 hour I will I'll just, just type, type faster. faster. I'll type faster. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a uh, intrinsic joy that comes when we are uh, we are harmonized with our innate nature, our psychophysical nature. And you heard of flow? Psychologists flow, call it yes. flow. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so interestingly, when they talk about the concept of flow. is flow a constant state or it's a phase that we get into sometimes hmm. because what i find is that say although i love writing but it's not that i love writing all the time <laughs> <laughs> so even in writing you get into a flow sometimes but in some other things you never get into a flow <laughs> you just have to push yourself to do it So there's a hint in the Bhagavad Gita that when Krishna says, "I am adventure," so like rock okay. climbing is not exactly enjoyable, but because of that particular jiva, this living being wants to make it. Out of pity, Krishna decides to enter into that activity just specifically for that person, 
So he is tasting Krishna and is thinking that because I climbed that mountain, I became happy. So if you are collecting stamps, collecting stones, doing a triathlon, 176 kilometers across the desert, so people are doing all these kind of things and one may wonder, where is the enjoyment here? Mm. They ask somebody, you just work for money, is that enjoyable? Like Andrew Carnegie, the millionaire, he was positively diagnosed with a condition where he was told, try to see as less money as possible because that gives you... <laughs> oh God! <laughs> and one day in a public bus, he was told to get down because he didn't have change. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this material world has enough uh, evidences that when you said that work has to be psychosomatically congruent or harmonized, harmonization, that's a very important point. And Krishna enters into those things enough to make you feel them enjoyable and out of his own sweet will when he leaves that work or that process you feel why I'm not able to enjoy it anymore. So he comes in, gives you that taste which is inherently spiritual, Beautiful. makes you aware that there is something which I need to do but then he leaves and the secret is as the Gita says, when you offer everything to him, slowly, slowly, you are now becoming adept at the art of work. And therefore, highly evolved spiritualists, when they have, like Prabhupada, work incessantly 18, 19, 20 hours a day, 11 years of the last 11 years of his life, going around the world. And if he was asked that, isn't this work? No. This was not work. This was just, I'm happy I was engaged. So, so this level of uh, enjoyment is what every, every Steve Jobs, every Bill Gates wants it. Do they get it? Well, in their honest moments, they say, I didn't get it. The world is convinced, though, you have to be happy. You are a billionaire. You have to be happy. You are so famous. You have to be happy. You have a million likes on Facebook. You have to be happy. And then people yeah. say, maybe I am. Maybe I am happy. But then in their honest private moments, when the kind of mask or the makeup of worldly acquisition wears off, then the ugly face rears its head. It's beautifully put. So let me... Uh, reword what you said if I understood rightly so yeah. you said that when people experience flow it is actually they experiencing Krishna at that time because yes. Krishna is the adventure in work and because Krishna is independent so it's not that every time we do the work we will experience that flow so yeah. sometimes we may sometimes we may not but uh, if we are in the flow so there could be two things, you know, we keep doing the things. I think it was uh, that Nobel laureate, uh, Somerset mom, Somerset, W. Somerset mom, he said, do you write every day or do you write when you are inspired? He said, I write only when I'm inspired and I make sure that inspiration arrives every day at 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> That dry British humor. <laughs> so the idea is that we could say that there is a place where the flow comes, and we go and keep ourselves in that place. And sometimes the flow comes and we move. Sometimes the flow doesn't come, but we are there in our place. We are. So I was thinking of like a mind map. What are the purposes of work? Okay. So if we consider one sir work. One could be remuneration, second could be contribution. These two are somewhat external, which we can see in this world. Yeah. Say a doctor, doctor works, they get a salary at the end and they see, okay, I saved somebody's life. So now the third could be harmonization. Okay. Harmonization is where I do what I'm meant to do and that also gives satisfaction. So all of these actually can give some pleasure. Remuneration can give satisfaction. 
connection uh, contribution can give you some satisfaction harmonization also gives satisfaction hmm? but the harmonization is the we could say intrinsic result mm -hmm. and then there is the last part which is connection our work connects us with krishna if we sva karmanatam abhyarcha siddhim vindati manava and you know, i found the first half of this verse quite fascinating it says yatah pravrittir bhutanam yena sarvam idam tatam means from him whom the world has emanated and he by whom the world is pervaded worship him with your work and you can attain perfection that means the 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 way i connected the first and second parts of this verse is that from whom the world has emanated that means your abilities are also coming from him and by whom the world is pervaded means that when you are working in this world actually you are offering those abilities to him who is manifested in the world in that sense the karma can become like a yagya like uh, in in when we worship the ganga we take water from the ganga and we offer it to the ganga uh, so or when we are doing yagya we understand that everything has come from brahma everything has come from the lord but we offer it back we offer the ghee to the fire the fire is considered to be brahma brahma arpanam brahma vir brahma agno brahmana hutam brahmaiva tena gantavyam brahma karma samadhina so the ghee is also is also the divine in one sense and we are offering the ghee so we could say work becomes worship when we see that our work is a gift of god and that same god is manifest in the world and when we serve in a when we work in a mood of service in a mood of uh, contrib selfless contribution uh, then we are worshiping the lord so through our work we establish a connection with the lord and this can happen at one level by giving the fruits of our work in some charity but it can also be just offering our consciousness to the lord through the work so when ma faleshu kadachana krishna says that don't be attached to the fruits of the work in my understanding he is primarily saying don't be caught in the remuneration part or don't be caught broadly speaking in the extrinsic results of the work so if you get caught in the extrinsic results you will miss out on the intrinsic ones remuneration and uh, contribution are extrinsic results of work then we could have harmonization which leads to inner satisfaction and we could say harmonization provides us inner material satisfaction it's subtle but it's material and connection if we do the work in a mood of worship Uh, then it leads to a spiritual satisfaction so detachment from work means don't be infatuated with too much of the remuneration part see the bigger picture and know that that bigger picture is what uh, what you need to focus on so if we focus only on the remuneration in work that will lead to bondage and krishna you could say that there are progressively higher levels uh, krishna at one level says that just work for some fruit work and sacrifice the fruits of your work that means he could be saying contribution so if these four we could explore these in detail in terms of what the bhagavad gita specifically says about this and how they could be applied in today's context to to uh, solve or to address the emptiness that many people experience while working but i maybe this will be another discussion isn't it it will take some time yeah because one of the major fallouts of the covid 19 crisis would be a massive rise in the unemployed mm. and people would be looking at uh spirituality for giving some kind of a solution so right now the the only uh, crime need would be bread but we can take it even higher than that it is not like just you give unemployment benefits therefore you will be happy 
you just get a new job at walmart or at amazon warehouse you'll be happy it is the it is a it is a very essence of work that is threatened by this worldwide crisis and if we can have some kind of a serious uh, wisdom based understanding it could benefit a lot of people yes definitely so i think this worth is worth exploring so i'll try to quickly summarize what we discussed today and then you can add some things if i have not uh, put in the summary i we discussed first the history of work history of conceptions of work yeah. that it is a result of it is a laborious uh, punishment as a result of rebellion against god and it is going to be miserable as saint augustine said then he had uh, work can be remunerative and creative that's what uh, michelangelo and their conception was and leonardo da vinci and then martin luther's idea was that work is also devotional work is also divine any kind of work any kind of work that then uh, mark said that work is work is spirit sapping it is boring and it uh, it uh, destroys people's character and potential so then i talked about how the vision of the world is also affected by the world view when vision of work is affected by the world view so often religions had the idea that this world is a veil of veil of tears as christianity says so then you just have to endure here so that you can get to the other world and then your work is the something which you have to bear but as the vision shifted say from in the renaissance where the world was a arena for artistic reproduction artistic uh, depiction then the reformation said that that those who assign those who say that the other world is all that matters we challenge their authority this an oversimplified depiction of that historical progression and science scientific revolution said that this world we can improve through technology so as the world view changed and this world is what matters by the time of karl marx the other world was considered to be like a belief induced by opium so then uh, we have to find happiness in this world almost However, like a conspiracy it was almost like a conspiracy to keep themselves yes. rich and ourselves poor yes conspiracy to keep people satisfied without any upward mobility yes because with the hope that you you don't have any material upward mobility but you will have spiritual upward mobility so then the the idea was capitalism presents the promise of meritocracy that if you work hard you will succeed but quite often the capitalists are so much in power and exploitative that people cannot rise up so meritocracy the uh, the philosophy of meritocracy sounds great for the winners and it sounds terrible for the losers because since if you are if you are poor that's your problem it's because you didn't do something right so then a lot of people we talked about some pe- people don't get the extrinsic results of work that they don't uh, get money position power and they don't get intrinsic results that they don't feel satisfied doing the work then they think why should i work at all so there is that emptiness then to address that emptiness we turn to the vision of the gita and then you pointed out that the gita talks about firstly work has to be done for maintenance then work is there is a art to work mm. where we avoid bondage and then we discuss what is that bondage we could say psychological bondage by which we get bound to the things that work buys and we keep craving from them so wws work watch and shop so we get bound by that and then so the way to so you then you, we also talk about the idea of when we work according to our nature there is a flow so i we concluded that that uh, mind map four parts work for remuneration then work for social contribution that krishna tells arjuna that don't look at this calculation that whether gaining a kingdom is worth losing your relatives your purpose is from higher perspective act 
to establish dharma in the world so that's a bigger picture and then also there is discussed about how when people are in flow that means that they experience intrinsic satisfaction in the work and they also are able to create something wonderful through it and then you mentioned that how when somebody is in flow that means they are experiencing krishna or krishna is manifesting to them as adventure as thrill and that's why we can't control we can't always maintain that the flow goes on but we can keep ourselves in the flow by doing our part like uh you know i may i make sure that inspiration comes every day so and lastly you said that work can also help us connect with krishna because he is the source of our abilities and he is also present in the world where we offer our work so work can be like a sacrifice in that sense so we will talk more about how these intrinsic and extrinsic results of work uh, can be uh, can be applied in today's context any points i missed out no i just just came up with something right now it just came up the top of mind that meritocracy is because i am good therefore i won because i have merit it therefore i have money i have power i have prestige and the suspicion today is because i have money therefore i must be good oh okay because i won therefore i must have worked hard therefore i must be superior and when this is not found to be true then the masses lose all hope in even meritocracy oh okay so we could say uh, if in our context this is really worth exploring later dharma leads to artha hmm? so virtue leads to wealth but if i presume because i have artha that means i must be having dharma exactly because i have wealth so i so so wealth can be a fruit of virtue but wealth is not the proof of virtue so when it is presumed like that then people start becoming uh, the you know, patronizing moralizing condescending and uh, then that that triggers a rebellion so if somebody who is at a higher level in hierarchy is there because i can clearly see they are better than me then i am okay that they are there but if i see that they are actually lousier than me <laughs> and still they are in a better position than me then my blood starts boiling at that time so and so how you know whether a gita based world view or gita based vision of the work how much would be it meritocracy but recognize and uh, uh, accept meritocracy this could also be a topic of discussion in the next session in fact i would say that for a post covid uh, for a covid 19 recovered world facing unemployment or a work crisis people are saying at least comparable to the 1929 great depression does the bhagavad gita give any hope any solace so what are so the last preparation part. what is the preparation for at least the the kind of economic problems which would come yes. they are said to be comparable with the depression great depression of 1929 oh okay so the impact will be that big so so with, so can the gita wisdom give a solid foundation for someone to work in that post recovery world that we will exp- uh, explore in our next segment oh okay that's a very good uh, segue to both our future discussion and the current situation thank you very much i look forward to that Hare Krishna. Uh.